This gentleman had a question. Hi, Matt. Yeah. Uh, before you had uh, named this for Mr. Cannon, uh, Ms. Christian of the Valley, uh, you, you know that the Buck Weaver, is my understanding, and it's right, was privy to the ongoing and beginning negotiation between the players and the gamblers. And this is just a one issue. I mean, I like Buck Weaver as much as anybody, but it seems like that de definition, I have to be a lawyer too in my other life, that, you know, that that misprision of a felony, that, that his actions could fall under that statute. I, I, I think that's correct. I mean, if they had uh, knowledge of the commission of a uh, felony, they had a legal obligation to report that to law enforcement authorities. and. If he had knowledge of well, the fixing, yeah. it would appear that he did, okay. uh, just as it would appear Jackson did as well. And so, you know, they both had the same legal obligation to uh, report that information to law enforcement authorities. Well, you know, that is actually, I think, a very interesting question, and it, it really comes down to one issue. What, what does the Hall of Fame represent? Uh, there are some people who say the Hall of Fame should simply represent your on-field accomplishments. And if that's the case, then, you know, Jackson and perhaps others should be admitted to the Hall of Fame. On the other hand, if uh, you look at uh, the Hall of Fame as some kind of uh, perhaps instrument to uh, uh, protect the integrity of the game, and that anybody who has acted contrary to the integrity of the game should be banned, then Jackson and others should be banned. But if, if that's the case, and it appears to be the standard that is being applied to Joe Jackson, then that same standard should be applied to Pete Rose, it should be applied to Ty Cobb, uh, and it should be applied to Charles Kaminsky. I, I just, you know, I don't think there should be a double standard where some people act contrary to the best interests of baseball and still get in the hall and others who uh, engage in misconduct related to the integrity of the game are banned from it. It should be, you know, either all get in or all get out. Okay, time for a couple. Uh, question and a comment from Mr. Cannon. Question is, is there evidence or is your belief that Austrian was involved in the theft of the documents? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that um, because I don't, I've never seen any evidence as to the exact chain of custody of the uh, grand jury uh, transcripts, but um, I do know that they were offered to for sale to New York newspapers by a uh, representative of uh, uh, Arnold Rothstein. And, and so, if I could just follow that up. That suggests that it was Rothstein who actually procured and arranged for the transcripts to be stolen. Um, and from there, they wind up in Alfred Austrian's briefcase in this Milwaukee courtroom in 1924. Now, Austrian, of course, is a lawyer with a prominent Chicago law firm, and clearly he knows better, I mean, everybody in the country uh, who was awake in 1921 knows that the grand jury testimony was stolen from the state's attorney's office in Chicago, and that's how the players got acquitted. So, I mean, it's, I, it, it would appear that whether Austrian procured them from Art Rothstein or whether Kaminsky, uh, Kaminsky uh, procured them from um, Rothstein and then gave them to Austrian, he's, He's implicated either way. Yeah, my comment is that uh, they very we bring up the Joe Jackson 375 and the World Series and everything like that, but there is the issue that in the games they lost, he hit about 200, in the games they won, he hit about 500, and 
a number of sports writers also speculated that in the game they lost, he wasn't exactly hustling for some of those balls out in the outfield. So there is, just to say that because he had 375, he's not for the World Series, he clearly didn't play very well in the games they lost. Um, it, that may very well be true. Um, I mean, I've never, you know, analyzed or looked at films or done anything that extensive, but uh, it does strike me that uh, if he had no fielding years and he actually set a World Series record that stood for 20 or 30 years of collecting 12 hits, that's pretty impressive evidence, plus the 375 average, plus the only home run in the World Series. That's pretty impressive evidence that he didn't throw the series or even throw any of the games. And most historians that I've ever read have concluded that he did not play to fix the series. I mean, I, I just think that's a pretty impressive record overall. Just one question about Buck Weaver again. When you were growing up, did your mother, your teacher in grammar school ever tell you, this sounds like you shouldn't snitch? And do you think that people can grow up with a conviction that it's terrible to, to rat on your friends? And would something like that, would a judge consider that in a trial? Because it seems like that's what, that's what he was. Well, I mean, people do respond to peer pressure, uh, but actually that's why there is a law called misprison of a felony, because uh, if everybody responded to peer pressure, it would be very hard to prosecute most crimes. And so the law imposes a legal obligation on citizens who have knowledge of the commission of a felony that they have an obligation to report that to law enforcement authorities. You said that growing up, your family never talked about the Black Sox. And I was just curious, you know, as just growing up as a child, um, I'm sure a lot of kids in your class or at school must have broached the issue just you being who you were. How did you I mean, br uh, bring up the subject with maybe your father or your grandfather? I don't think at that time period um, when I was growing up that there was as much interest in the Black Sox scandal as there is up there as there is now, really. And uh, more than it was more whether you were a Cub fan or a Sox fan, and those people didn't <laughs> speak to one another. But um, so I honestly, I don't remember that discussion ever coming up. And I don't know if it was just because we were just so involved with the day-to-day -day, um, you know, running of the ball team at the time and what was going on then, but I don't remember. You know, now you see so much, and when the movie brought it out, you know, there was a lot of talk about it, and a lot of serious baseball fans talked about it. But I really do, um, thank you for that question, and um, I do have problems with a lot of the uh, suggestions that Mr. Cannon has made about um, Charles Comiskey being immoral and illegal, and to this point, I am not a specialist in the Black Sox scandal whatsoever, but I've never known him to be accused of that, except for being cheap and not uh, paying the um, players what they should be. And I will take this on as an issue to investigate more about uh, the trial in Milwaukee and um, the evidence that was brought forward because um, I find that to be very challenging. Thank you. So right here. Well, I'm <clears throat> thinking back to say, the social norms of 1919 and what might have been expected. If uh, Buck Weaver and Joe Jackson, at least after the fact, uh, went to their boss try to report what they knew, would you would it really have been expected for them to say, well, he didn't respond, so I'm going to go to the police, I'm going to go over my boss's head, go to the police, tell on my boss. Did anyone do anything like that in that time? I mean, to be saying that they should be guilty because they didn't go to the police. The second part of that, in 19, if someone went to the police October 5th of 1919, is there the slightest chance that the police would have taken them seriously on anything? No. I think that's the big issue. I think your points were well taken. Is that, is that you know, what kind of action would have, been, would have been taken? Because once again, everybody in the world knew this fix. It was the worst kept secret. Uh, the odds changed and, and so forth. And just, you know, they could have uh, you know, called out the rules very, they didn't.
Thank you, sir. Your, your points were very well taken. The norms there, you know, snitching was something that is, is a big thing for society. You know, plus also, uh, as I said before, Weaver did not really believe his teammates were going to go through with it. They were really, it was just a really poorly hatched plan. It was also, it was a good quality team, but it wasn't a particularly close team. There were different cliques. Uh, Eddie Collins and the, the college boy tended to hang with uh, certain guys. There was Gandalf's element that, that were really the ringleaders of this. and um, It would probably have been difficult to uh, hatch it among the entire team. And, and again, but I think the prevailing sentiment at the time was you just didn't rat somebody out for something like that. And I don't know that it, going to the law enforcement ever occurred to anybody. Doesn't seem as I, I would just like to say, though, that uh, it's actually an issue that uh, continues to trouble our society: corporate misconduct and the ethical obligation of employees to report corporate misconduct. Uh, you see that in the, the Enron uh, collapse, for example, and there have been many other instances of uh, corporate misconduct, and whether the employees have an obligation to their employer or a larger obligation, ethical and moral and legal, to society at large to report criminal misconduct. Um, there is the, as I mentioned, the misprison of a felony statute which imposes that obligation on all citizens. In addition, Congress has relatively recently enacted uh, uh, legislation that protects whistleblowers corporate whistleblowers uh, who uh, reveal instances of corporate misconduct that protects them in their uh, job so that they don't get to punished or fired for reporting criminal uh, behavior to uh, law enforcement authorities. I want to thank each member of the panel for joining us tonight, for lending us their time and their expertise. And most of all, I want to thank you for coming and making this the most informative night. Society and also for the staff of Kudabak.com who helped us with tonight's event. Um, before you leave, if you can, take a brief moment to fill out, um, there's a survey in your small program. We do like to keep track of our programs and some information, so please share that with us. And thank you very much, and have a good evening.